There's an idea much later that John Milton develops in, in Paradise Lost, which is an amazing poem. And it, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a profound enough poem so that it's almost been incorporated into the biblical structure, I would say. So the corpus of Christianity post-Milton was saturated by the Miltonic stories of Satan's rebellion. None of that's in the, in the, in the biblical texts. Or it's only hinted at in, in very brief passages. And Milton wrote his poem to justify the, wor- the ways of God to man, which is quite an ambition. Really, it's an amazing, profound ambition to tr- try to produce something, to produce a literary work that justifies being to human beings, because that's what Milton was trying to do. So one of my readers here sent me a link the other day, or, or viewers, to a work of philosophy by an Australian philosopher whose name I don't remember, who basically wrote a book saying that being as such, human experience, is so corrupt and so permeated by suffering that it would be better if it had never existed at all. It's sort of the ultimate expression of nihilism. And Goethe in, in Faust, his Mephistopheles, who's a satanic character, obviously, has that as a credo. That, that's, that's Satan's fundamental motivation, is his objection to creation itself, is that creation is so flawed and so rife with suffering that it would be better if it had never existed at all. And so that's his motivation for attempting to continue to destroy it. But in Milton's Paradise Lost, Satan is an intellectual figure. And you see that motif emerge very frequently, by the way, in popular culture. So, for example, in The Lion King, the figure of Scar, who's a satanic figure, is also hyper-intellectual. And that's very common. That you know, It's the evil scientist motif, or the, or the evil advisor to the king, the same motif. It, it encapsulates something about rationality, and it, what it seems to encapsulate is the idea that rationality, like Satan, is, is the highest angel in God's heavenly kingdom. It's a psychological idea, you know, that the most powerful sub-element of the human psyche is the intellect. And, and, and it's the thing that shines out above all within the domain of humanity and maybe across the, the, the domain of life itself. The human intellect, there's something absolutely remarkable about it. But it has a flaw, and the flaw is that it tends to fall in love with its own productions and to assume that they're total. Solzhenitsyn, when he was writing the Gulag Archipelago, had a warning about that with regards to totalitarian ideology. And he said that the price of selling your God-given soul to the entrapments of, of human dogma was slavery and death, essentially. And Satan, in, Ma- in Milton's Paradise Lost, Satan decides that he can do without the transcendent, he can do without God, and that's why he foments rebellion. It's something like that. And the consequence of that, the immediate consequence from Milton's perspective was that as soon as Satan decided that what he knew was sufficient and that he could do without the transcendent, which you might think about as the domain outside of what you know, something like that, immediately he was in hell. And when I read Paradise Lost, I was studying totalitarianism and I thought, you know, the poet, the true poet, like a prophet, is someone who has intimations of the future. And maybe that's because the poetic mind, the philosophical or prophetic mind, is a pattern detector, and and, and there are people who can detect the underlying, it's like the melody of, of a nation. Melody as in song, the song of a nation, and can see how it's going to develop across the centuries. You see this, you see that in Nietzsche, because Nietzsche, for example, in the mid, you know, around 1860 or so, I mean, he prophesied what was going to happen in the 20th century. He said that, he said specifically that the specter of communism would kill millions of people in the 20th century. It's an amazing prophecy. He said that in the notes that became will to power. And and Dostoevsky was of the same sort of mind, someone who was in touch enough with the fundamental patterns of, 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 of human movement that they could extrapolate out into the future and see what was coming. And I mean, some people are very good at detecting patterns, you know, and, and uh, Milton, I think, was of that sort. And I think he had intimations of what was coming as, 
human rationality became more and more powerful and, and technology became more and more powerful. And the intimation was that we would produce systems that dispensed with God, that were completely rational and completely total, that would immediately turn everything they touched into something indistinguishable from hell. And Milton's warning was, and it's embodied in the poem, is that the rational mind that generates a production and then worships it as if it's absolute immediately occupies hell. So what does that have to do with the Tower of Babel? Well, you know what, back in two, 2008 when, the, when, when we had that economic collapse, this strange idea emerged politically and that was the idea of too big to fail. And I thought about that idea for a long time because I thought there's something deeply wrong with that. Because one of the things that made Marx wrong was see, Marx believed that capital would flow into the hands of fewer and fewer people. And that the dissociation between the rich and the poor would become more extreme as capitalism developed. And like so many things that Marx said, that's, it's kind of true. It's kind of true in that the distribution of wealth, and in fact the distribution of anything that's produced, follows a Pareto pattern. And the Pareto pattern basically is that a small proportion of people end up with the bulk of the goods. And it isn't just money. It's, it's anything that people produce creatively ends up in that distribution. And that's actually... The economists call that the Matthew Principle, and they take that from a statement in the New Testament, and the statement is, to those who have everything, more will be given, and from those who have nothing, everything will be taken. And it's, it's a map of the ma manner in which the world manifests itself, where human creative production is involved, and the map seems to indicate that as you start to produce and you're successful, the probability that you will continue to be successful or accelerate increases as you're successful. And as you fail, the probability that you will fail starts to accelerate. So in your progress through life looks like this, or like this, something like that. And the reason that Marx was right was because he noted that as a feature of the capitalist system. The reason that he was wrong is that it's not a feature that's specific to a capitalist system. It's a feature that's general to all systems of creative production that are known. And so it's like a natural law, and it's enough of a natural law, by the way, that the distribution of wealth can be modeled by physical models using the same equations that govern the distribution of gas molecules in a vacuum. So it's a really profound, it's a fundamentally profound observation about the world, the way the world lays itself out. And it's problematic, because if resources accrue, unfairly to a small minority of people and there's a natural law-like element to that that has to be dealt with from a social perspective because if the inequality becomes too extreme then the whole system will destabilize and so you can have an intelligent discussion about how to mitigate the effects of the transfer of creative production into the hands of a small number of people now the other reason however Having said that, the other reason that Marx was wrong, there's a number of them, one is that even though creative products end up in the hands of a small number of people, it's not the same people consistently across time. It's the same proportion of people. And that's not the same thing. You know, like, imagine that there's water going down a drain, and you say, well, look at the spiral. It's permanent. You think, well, the spiral's permanent, but the water molecules aren't. They're moving through it. And it's the same in some sense with the Pareto distribution, is that there's a 1%, and there's always a 1%, but it's not the same people. It's, and in, it, it, the stability of it di differs from culture to culture, but there's a lot of movement in the upper 1%, a tremendous amount of movement. And one of the reasons for that movement is that things get large, and then they get too large, and then they collapse. And so, in 2008, when the politicians said, too big to fail, they got something truly backwards, as far as I can tell. And that was, it was a reverse, the statement was reversed. It should have been, so big it had to fail. And that's what I think 
the story of the Tower of Babel is about. It's, it's a warning against the expansion of a system until it encompasses everything. It's a warning against totalitarian presumption. So what happens, for example, when people set out to build the Tower of Babel is they want to build a structure that reaches to heaven. Right? So the idea is that it can, it can, it can replace... It can replace the role of God. It's something like that. It can erase the distinction between earth and heaven. And so there's a utopian kind of vision there as well. As we can build a structure that's so large and encompassing that, that, that it can replace heaven itself. And that's an interesting... The fact that that doesn't work and that God objects to it is also extraordinarily interesting. And it's an indication to me of the unbelievable profundity of these stories. It's like... I think one thing we should have learned from the 20th century, but of course didn't, was that there's something extraordinarily dangerous about totalitarian utopian visions. That's something Dostoevsky wrote about, by the way, in his great book, Notes from Underground, because Dostoevsky had figured out by the early 1900s that there was something very, very pathological about a utopian vision of perfection, that it was profoundly anti-human. And, and notes, in Notes from Underground, he demolishes the notion of utopia. One of the things he says that I loved, it's so brilliant, he said, imagine that you brought the socialist utopia into being. And Dostoevsky says, and that human beings had nothing to do except eat, drink, and busy themselves with the continuation of the species. He said that the first thing that would happen under circumstances like that would be that human beings would go mad and break the system, smash it, just so that something unexpected and crazy could happen, because human beings don't want utopian comfort and certainty. They want adventure and chaos and uncertainty. And so that the very notion of a utopia was anti-human, because we're not built for static utopia. We're built for a dynamic situation where there's demands placed on us, and where there's the optimal amount of uncertainty. Well, we know what happened in the 20th century as a consequence of the widespread promulgation of utopian schemes, and what happened was mayhem on a scale that had never been matched in the entire history of humanity. And that's really saying something, because there was plenty of mayhem before the 20th century. I guess there wasn't as much industrial clout behind it. And so, so early, you see, so early in the biblical narrative, you have a warning against hubris. And, and some indication that properly functioning systems have an appropriate scale. I read an article in The Economist magazine this week about the rise of nationalist movements all over the world as a counterbalance to globalization, maybe it's most marked with the European economic community. And the economist writers were curious about why that counter-movement has been developing, but it seems to me that it's also a Tower of Babel phenomena, is that, and maybe this is most evident in the European economic community, to bring all of that multiplicity under the what would you call it, under the umbrella of a single unity, is to simultaneously erect a system where the top is so far from the bottom that the bottom has no connection to the top. You know, you, your, your, your social systems have to be large enough so they protect you, but small enough so that you have a place in them. And it seems to me, perhaps, that's what's happened in, in places like the EEC, is that the distance between the typical citizen and the bureaucracy that runs the entire structure has got so great that it's an element of destabilization in and of itself and so people revert back to say nationalistic identities because it's something that they can relate to it, there's, a, there's a history there and a shared identity, a genuine identity, a gen, an, a, an identity of language and tradition that's not an artificial imposition from the top, an artificial abstract imposition. 
In, in the Egyptian creation myth, the version I'm familiar, most familiar with, in, in the previous creation myth, an older one, the Mesopotamian creation myth, mostly what you see menacing humanity is Tiamat. She's the dragon of chaos, and so that's nature. It's really, it's really mother nature, red in tooth and claw. But by the time the Egyptians come along, it isn't only nature that threatens humanity. It's the social structure itself. And so the Egyptians had two deities that represented the social structure, and one was Osiris, who was like the spirit of the father. He was a great hero who established Egypt, but became old and, and willfully blind and, 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 uh, and senile. And he had an evil brother named Seth. And Seth was always conspiring to overthrow him. And because Osiris ignored him long enough, Seth did overthrow him, chopped him into pieces, and distributed him all around the kingdom. And his son Horus had to come back and fight. Osiris's son Horus had to come back and defeat Seth to take the kingdom back. And that's how that story ends. But the Egyptians seem to have realized, maybe because they had become bureaucratized to quite a substantial degree, that it wasn't only nature that threatened humankind, it was also the proclivity of human organizations to become too large, too unwieldy, too deceitful, and too willfully blind, and therefore liable to collapse. And again, I see echoes of that in this story of the Tower of Babel. So, it's a calling for a kind of humility of social engineering. One of the other things I've learned as a social scientist, and I've been warned about this by I would say great social scientists, that you want to be very careful about doing large-scale experimentation with large-scale systems. Because the probability that if you implement a scheme in a large-scale social system, that that scheme will have the result you intended is negligible. What will happen will be something that you don't intend, and even worse, something that works at counter-purposes to your original intent. And so, and that, that makes sense, because if you have a very, very complex system, and you perturb it, the probability that you can predict the consequence of the perturbation is extraordinarily low, obviously. If a system works, though, you, you think you understand it, because it works. And so you think it's simpler than it actually is, and so then you think that your model of it is correct, and then you think that your manipulation of the model, which produces the outcome you model will be the outcome that's actually produced in the world. And that doesn't work at all. I thought about that an awful lot, thinking about how to remediate social systems, because obviously they need careful attention and adjustment. And it struck me that the proper strategy for implementing social change is to stay within your domain of competence. And that requires humility, which is a, a virtue that is never promoted in modern culture, I would say. It's, it's a virtue that you can hardly even talk about. But humility means you're probably not as smart as you think you are, and you should be careful. And so then the question might be, well, okay, you should be careful, but perhaps you still want to do good, or you, you want to make some positive changes. How can you be careful and do good? And, then I would say, well, you try not to step outside of the boundaries of your competence, and you start small, and you start with things that you actually could adjust, that you actually do understand, that you actually could fix. I, I mentioned to you at one point that one of the things Carl Jung said was that modern men don't see God because they don't look low enough. It's a very interesting phrase, and one of the things that I've been promoting, I suppose, online is the idea that you should restrict your attempts to fix things to what's at hand. So there's probably things about you that you could fix, right? Things that you know that aren't right. Not anyone else's opinion, your own opinion, that aren't right. You can fix them. Maybe there's some things that you could adjust in your family. Although that gets hard. You have to have your act together a lot before you can start to adjust your family. Because things can kick back on you really hard. And you think, well, 
It's hard to put yourself together. It's really hard to put your family together. Why the hell do you think you can put the world together? Right? Because obviously the world is more complicated than you and your family. And so if, you, if you're stymied in your attempts even to set your own house in order, which of course you are, then you would think that what that would do would be to make you very, very leery about announcing your broad-scale plans for social revolution. <laughs> well, it's a peculiar thing because that isn't how it works, because people are much more likely to announce their plans for broad-scale social revolution than they are to try to set themselves straight or to set their family straight. And I think the reason for that is that as soon as they try to set themselves straight or their families, the system immediately kicks back at them, right? Instantly. Whereas if they announce their plans for large-scale social revolution, the lag between the announcement and the kickback <laughs> is so long that they don't recognize that there's any error there. And so, you know, you can get away with being wrong if, if, if nothing falls on you for a while. And so... And it's also an incitement to hubris, because you can announce your, your plans for large-scale social revolution and stand back and you don't get hit by lightning and you think, well, I might be right, even though you're not. You're seriously not right. I might be right. And then you think, well, how wonderful is that? Especially if you could do it without any real effort. And I really do think, fundamentally, I believe that that's what universities teach students now. That's what they teach them to do. I, I really believe that. And I think it's absolutely appalling. And I think it's horribly dangerous. Because it's not that easy to fix things. Especially if you don't... Especially if you're not committed to it. And I think you know if you're committed because what you try to do is you try to straighten out your own life first. And that's enough. Like there's a, I think it's a statement in the New Testament that it's... I think it's in the New Testament that it's more difficult to rule yourself than to rule the city. And that's not a metaphor. It's like all of you who've made announcements to yourself about changing your diet and going to the gym every January know perfectly well how difficult it is to regulate your own impulses and to bring yourself under the control of some, what would you say, well-structured and ethical, attentive structure of values it's extraordinarily difficult, and so people don't do it, and they, instead they wander off, and I think they create towers of Babel. And the story indicates, well, those things collapse under their own weight, and everyone goes their own direction.